You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org. Hello, welcome uh, to Makers at North Park Baptist Church. My name is Shalise. If we have never met, um, I'm one of the pastors at Maker's Church And I am so excited uh, to get to share. This is my first time sharing with you guys, with us as a joint family and community. Um, And I'm I'm very, very excited. So I'm a pastor at Makers. I'm also a high school English teacher. So pray for me because it's getting to be that time of year where you're like, "Uh uh-huh, okay, I can do this, right? They say never ask a teacher if they want to be a teacher in like February, March. Wait till after summer break. And then it's like, yes, I love my job. Um, I am also married to my beautiful husband, Drew, who is in the back, and he's working the camera today, so I'm like, get my good, my good angles, babe, this side. Um, I'm a dog mom. I have a dog named Lila, and the most boring Instagram account ever. If you asked Pastor Derek last week, he put me on blast, because apparently all I do is take pictures of my garden, and you know what? I don't care. Some might call it boring. I call it... Uh, beautiful. You know, some people have children, and you take 9,000 pictures of your kids. I have butterleaf lettuce. It's basically the same thing. So, I get it. It's not super cool, but everybody has their thing that they do to, you know, relax, to unwind. Over the last few years, I've really enjoyed gardening. Um, It's been something that has brought me a lot of joy. It's nice to just get outside, Um, and spend some time in the fresh air. But I think really what it is, is deep down, I love watching something grow. I love putting in the time and the energy it takes from that little seed, and then you see the little thing, you're like, babe, come quick, the cucumber has leaves, it's alive, you know, and it's so exciting to just watch something grow and to watch all the hard work and the effort and the time that you've put into something actually takes fruit. It brings me a great amount of joy. And if you're just joining us, uh, we are in the middle of a series on Philippians where we are talking about a citizen's guide to joy. And um, Pastor Derek has been talking about this idea that joy is not something that is always physical or material or circumstantial, but that we are actually called into a new kind of kingdom where our joy is something that comes only from Christ and not something that, you know, is is based on how we're doing in the moment. Um, This week has been a week of great joy for me, though. Not only has my broccoli been blooming gorgeously, you saw it if you follow me on Instagram, Um, but it's been raining a lot, which I love. Uh, My husband and I also had a great Valentine's Day, which is awesome, and my third baby girl niece was born, the day after Valentine's Day, and she has all her fingers and toes, so we're very, very excited. Um, But she is gorgeous and beautiful, and so this week has been one of great joy for me. And if you're like me, that's usually what happens. Good things start to happen, and our joy increases, right? Good things happen, and our joy increases, and it grows, but what do we do when good things aren't happening, Right? And that's what we're looking at in this series is how do we look at Paul, this man who is in the midst of a time and a season of intense suffering and persecution and yet possesses such an inexplicable joy. And how do we become people of that new kind of kingdom? Now, I'm not sure if Paul was a gardener, but he was a church planter. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't come up with that joke. My husband did. So if you don't like it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, (laughs) In fact, the church in Philippi, uh, who Philippians is written to, was the first church that Paul actually planted. And so we could make a conjecture that it might be his favorite. Because why is the firstborn not your favorite? Or the best that ever came, you know. Everything else is like, oh, that was good. But the first one carries so much special significance. Right, Mom? That's right. And so it becomes really clear that Paul loves this church. He is invested in this church. It has been years and years and years that he's been watching this church grow. And now in his absence, he wants to make sure that they continue to grow. That they continue to see this fruit that was coming from their union and from their church. And so we're going to pick up in Philippians 1. 
verse 12 here. Philippians 1, 12 through 14. It says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. This is really an interesting passage of this text. Because Paul is saying that his time in prison, his ability to be in prison and still to praise God and still to lift his praises to God has not only shifted his heart, but he is beginning to see the imperial guard, the soldiers, all come to know Jesus and know the love of God. But not only that, he says, and all the rest. He says, not only is the gospel advancing, not only is the guard coming to know Jesus, not only all the rest, but he says even the brothers and sisters, the church, because they are witnessing the boldness of Paul, says they are beginning to grow. They are beginning to speak in boldness without fear. And this passage of scripture is so radical because what it tells us is that when we witness the boldness of others in the face of persecution and trials and sufferings, we can actually grow our own faith. I wish everything worked like that, right? I wish that I could watch other people work out and get muscles. That would be awesome. I wish I could just sit there and be like, yes, five more, you can do it. And then all of a sudden like my biceps would get bigger. But we know that that's not how it works. And so unfortunately, my husband and I have to get up many days a week, super, super early before work, and and we go and we work out. But especially this past week, it's so hard to get out of bed when it's raining. Does anybody else just love the rain? Probably because we don't live in like Seattle. (laughs) I love when it rains here. Yeah, I love the rain, especially in the morning. And it's so hard to get out of bed. But these storms we've been having have been crazy. I was standing outside in our front yard. Um, no, I was, in, I was not in the front yard. I was inside in the shelter of the house when it was raining and I was standing there and I was watching these palm trees. We have this like line of palm trees outside of our house and I'm watching these palm trees and the wind is just whipping. And have you ever seen a palm tree like do this? And then it comes back and you're like, oh, it's, that is going to fall over. Like there, this thing is defying the laws of gravity. There's no way that this palm tree stays up. But I've seen footage of like hurricanes and tsunamis and just insane winds and storms come. And somehow these palm trees, they survive. Houses go by, cars go by, cows. But the palm trees are fine, right? Right. And I thought there's got to be something to palm trees, some truth that we can pull as a church. So these are our lessons for us as the church from Paul and the palm trees. But like, I got dad, that was also my husband. He's got dad jokes for days. Lesson number one. Okay, lesson number one. You have to grow deep and wide. A lot of trees, traditional trees, they have a root system that grows very very deep. Palm trees are very different. Palm trees have adventitious roots. What adventitious roots mean is that unlike other trees, they'll grow a big root and then a bunch of little roots will actually jump off of that root. Every single root of a palm tree is connected to the trunk of the tree. It will grow hundreds, if not thousands, of tiny little roots that go out sometimes as far as 50 feet. There are so many roots that grow that you can't actually tell where one root begins and the other ends. They become so, so interconnected. And as I was thinking about this, I was like, that's supposed to be us. We're supposed to be those roots, those people that are connected to the source of life, which is Jesus. He says that he is the vine and we are the branches. We're not meant to just grow off of one another. We're meant to grow wide. And what happens is that we grow and we grow and we become so interconnected to one another that that becomes our source of strength. And so we as a church find our source of life 
and Jesus, but in the storms and the hard times, we're meant to find our source of strength from our community, from one another. See, Paul had close, close friends. He even begins the book of Philippians by writing it from him and Timothy. And Timothy was Paul's friend, and they traveled together. Paul was like a mentor to, or Timothy was like a, yeah, Paul was a mentor to Timothy. And even in Philippians 2, listen to what Paul says of Timothy. He says, I have no one else like him. And that struck me as I was thinking about this idea of being so interconnected that you can't really separate yourself from one another. You know, whether Pastor Derek and Pastor Mark like it or not, nine years ago, our stories became interconnected. And over the past nine years, Derek and Mark and people like them have just been champions of my growth. They have watched me grow and grow, sometimes in the wrong direction, sometimes in the right direction. And we have become so interconnected that I can't help but think, like, there is no one else like them. I have no one else like them. And I'm sure you feel the same way. We all have people in our lives that we could say, I would not be the person I am today if it wasn't because of them. But to be honest, I didn't always want them around. I was like, I want to do what I want to do, and I don't want to have to need you. I don't want to have to rely on you or depend on you. I just want to do it myself. And then if I mess up, like, nobody else will be there to see it. It'll just be me, and I don't want to have to need you or have to have you support me or walk alongside me. I just want to do it on my own. But listen to what (laughs) Paul writes to the church in Ephesians. He says, Ephesians 3, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people. Being rooted and established in love, we have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So we can't just grow deep, we also have to become interconnected and grow wide. Lesson number two, bend, don't break. Bend, don't break. Now, traditional trees, they grow in this cylindrical shape. It's very neat. It's very clean. If you ever cut a tree down, you can actually look at the rings. The rings will tell you a story. They'll not only tell you how old the tree is, they'll also tell you what the weather was like that year. Did you know that? Did you know you could cut a tree open and see what the weather was like 20 years ago? It will tell you how many storms that tree has been through, but not a palm tree because there's nothing neat and cylindrical about a palm tree. It doesn't go out neatly in these little, it's mush. The inside is not even wood. It's like this mushy fibrous tissue that becomes so malleable and interconnected that you can't tell where one part of it ends and one part of it begins because it's all just this big mess of fibrous tissue together. Now, for those of you who like order and structure, that sounds like your nightmare. You're like, that is a stupid tree. We should not have palm trees, right? But isn't it interesting that the very thing that makes it messy is the very thing that keeps it from breaking? Because the fibers in a palm tree actually have the capacity to change and morph shape and then go back to their original form. That's why a palm tree can bend like 40 or 50 degrees in the wind and then go right back to its original shape without snapping. See, their strength comes from their flexibility. And I think the lesson for us that we have to learn is strength and flexibility have to go hand in hand. You ever seen those really strong people that can't, like, touch their toes because they walk like this? And they're like, bah, you know. 
They're like, that's great that you're super, super strong. But like, if you don't also have flexibility, that's why they tell you, you have to stretch. And I'm always one of those people that's like, it's fine. I don't need to stretch. And then the next day I can't even walk because I'm like, everything hurts. If you grow strong, but you do not grow flexible, you will break. I don't know a more flexible church than Maker's Church. We have no structure. We don't even know how old we are. We change more than we stay the same. We've had to be flexible. We've had to be able to pivot and turn and pivot back and then go back to where we started. We, I mean, we're just all over the place, it seems like. But we wouldn't be able to even be here today if we didn't have that flexibility to be able to bend and move when the wind takes us somewhere. And I think it's so perfect that God has partnered us with North Park Baptist Church, a church with roots that go over 100 years. Talk about being strong. Talk about being rooted in such incredible and amazing things. And to be honest, you guys have had to bend a lot since we got here. Some of you are like in different seats. <laughs> You're like, that used to be my seat. Now it's not my seat. Others of you are like, I don't like that music. You know, I don't like, oh, you know, and we're all learning how to be flexible with one another. Because to be honest, just because God calls us to something doesn't mean it's easy. (laughs) Doesn't mean it's not going to hurt when you're like, I didn't know I could bend that way. Okay. Right? And I think there's something in that for us because I don't know about you, but I feel like we've been doing things a long time the way that we wanted to do them. And I would guess that you guys have been doing things a long time the way that you wanted to do them. And I wonder if God's saying, great, you've had your time, but now it's my time. Now we're going to do things the way that I want to do them. Lesson number three. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I know that there are so many of us in this room who have faced some intense storms. Maybe some of you are in the middle of it right now. Sometimes the storms can be really obvious. You can see it from a mile away. You have people like Amanda who so bravely share their stories, right? And you can see just the storms that she has faced and the battles that she has fought. Sometimes storms aren't so obvious. You have those internal storms, those darknesses, that depression, the anxiety, the infertility, the health issues, things that by looking at somebody, they would appear fine and you would never know how much they were hurting or how much they were suffering. And I think one of the things that is so important for us to remember in, in, in talking about these things is it does not matter what kind of suffering you experience. If that is your story, there's weight to that and there's power to that. And I spent a lot of years feeling like, well, but mine's not as bad as that person. I mean, like, you know, I haven't had that happen to me. And we start to play this comparison game as if we're not allowed to not be okay. As if we're not allowed to not feel our own hurts and our own suffering in the way that it comes to us. And I think because of that, a lot of times we prolong our suffering because we can't just name it and call it out and address it for what it is. See, I think what is beautiful about what Paul is calling the church into in this letter, he's calling them to hold on and to have trust in a God even when they don't understand what's happening. Right, he's in prison. And I don't even understand how Paul is in prison. And he's like, I'm worried about you guys. I'm like, if I'm Paul, I'm worried about myself. But he's in prison worrying about them. How are they going to survive? How are they going to get through this hard time? He wants them to know that it doesn't matter the storms that they're facing, that we are not alone ever in these storms. 2 Corinthians 4 says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Because we have this ministry, we have this community, we have this church, we have these people beside us. Because of this, we do not lose heart. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. 
and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. He says, you know where the light shines the brightest is in the darkest moments. He says, the light shines the brightest in these darkest moments. In Paul's darkest moments sitting in that jail, he's reminding himself the whole palace guard, everyone else, because of the suffering that I'm in, they are all going to know who God is. They're all going to know about the love of God. That doesn't mean that the storms are not hard. We would be foolish to think we could just say, well, God's got it, everything's better. That doesn't mean that it is not going to be a battle, that it is not going to be a fight. That doesn't mean you won't feel the full weight of your experiences. That does not mean just because you trust God, you can't grieve and mourn and feel that hurt or feel that pain. But as we're wrestling in these moments with those feelings, this is the truth that I want us to hold on to. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. These storms will not break us. These storms will not break us, but they will shape us. See, we will come out of these experiences different. We will come out of them pushed and pressed and feeling that weight. He says, but we will not break. And I'm sure there are some of you sitting here right now who through the storms that you have faced in your life, you feel broken. You feel different. You felt pressed and crushed, perplexed and abandoned. But the truth is our brokenness does not disqualify us from being used by God. And this is the next part of Paul's letter to the Philippians. He says this to them. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. See, this is such an interesting piece of scripture right here because he's talking about how everybody is coming to know Christ, but what's happening over at the church? So there's there's discontent amongst the church because of the way that they were preaching the gospel. He says, those people, they're not doing it the right way. They're saying things, but they don't even know you, Paul. They don't know about your suffering. They don't know what we, they have no right. They have no right to preach a gospel that they don't even know about. And you can see them beginning to get frustrated with one another and angry. And they're not doing it the way that I want to do it. And Paul says, so what? Who cares? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. I hate, I mean, we're not going to get it perfect. Can we, I mean, I feel like we've already laid that out, right? Like we, as a church, we are not going to get it perfect. So what? Can the gospel be bigger than that? Because I think that's what Paul is trying to get to. This is not about the way you want to do something. It's not about the way I want to do something. It's not if we have even the right motives. He's saying God can use broken people doing it the wrong way and the gospel can still advance. And that is what brings Paul joy. And I wonder if that was our greatest joy, how different we would be. What if our greatest joy was watching God use our brokenness to bring others to him? Watching him use a bunch of messy, 
interconnected, deeply dependent people to proclaim the gospel to this city, to North Park, to our families, to the people that we love and that we care about. And I'm sure that there are some of you sitting here today who you don't feel like that's even on the table. They're like, I can't advance the gospel. I'm barely holding on myself. And if you're here and that's where you're at, I'm so glad that you are here. And what I wanna tell you is get connected. We cannot be your source of life, but we can be your source of strength, right? And when we join together, we become so much stronger to face every single type of storm that may come our way. So if you bow your heads with me, I just wanna open us up for a time of prayer. Maybe you're here today and just the thought of even trusting again, whether it's trusting a church or trusting in God just seems so far beyond what you're capable of. Maybe you're here this morning and you've just felt like you're so alone in the things that you have been facing. No matter what kind of storms have been hitting you, I just want you to remember this. Most trees grow deep and wide roots long, long before they ever grow a branch, long before you ever see any fruit. And just because you can't see what's happening does not mean that God is not moving and he's not working, he's not strengthening you where it matters and not giving you strength and sustaining you where it counts. Jeremiah 17 says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So if that's you this morning, if you are here and you are just facing a storm, it doesn't matter how big or how small, I just wanna pray with you and we wanna lift you up and praise this morning. So if that's you, if you would just raise your hand this morning, I would love to be able to pray with you with every head down. If that's you and you're just, oh God, I don't even know where to go from here. God, you see every hand that is lifted. Every person who's just declared, God, that the wind and the waves have us frightened, that we see the storm ahead, God, and it just feels sometimes impossible to, to keep fighting, God, to keep pushing, to keep trusting you. God, I pray for a renewed sense of trust for every person here. God, I pray against fear. I pray against insecurity. God, I pray against doubt. I pray against every lie of the enemy. God, that would have us feeling isolated and alone. God, we just trust you this morning. Maybe you're here and you've been through the storms and you do not feel stronger. You feel like that storm broke you in half. You do not feel like the same person that you once were. And I wanna pray for you if you're here this morning and you just feel like, man, I wanna get back to my old self. I wanna be the person and that strength that I had before. And if that's you, if you would just raise your hand. God, we just lift up every person, Lord, who has just been fighting and fighting and fighting, God, and ask for restoration. God, not just that you uh, would mend, but that you would make new. God, just bring new life to every person who, God, has made it to the other side and just wants a fresh start. Psalm 92 says, The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. 
They are ever full of sap and green to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. You are listening to the Maker's Church Podcast. For more information about our community, please visit makerschurch.org.